pause for just a moment. Heavenly Father, your word is living and powerful. And my prayer for us today is that you would speak to us. May each of us not hear the human voice, but the still small voice. And I pray, Lord, there be nothing about me in my speech or my mannerisms that would stand between you and, and your children. You have a message for us, and I just pray that uh, it be delivered according to your will. And I give you thanks in Jesus' name. Okay, this is a study on Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we start out at Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6. You know the story. Moses has been minding his own business, tending sheep, and he sees a, a bush that appears to be on fire, but it's not burning up. It was, it was unusual, so he, he just had to go check that out. And we know that when he got close there, the Lord spoke to him out of that bush. He said, don't go any farther until you take your sandals off because you're, you're on holy ground. And so he, he said to Moses, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He identifies himself to Moses. And he gives him a job to do, a mission. Go back to the children of Israel. Go back to Pharaoh and, and tell him to let my people go so they can come worship me. Well, we know how that went. The people were reluctant to accept Moses, and um, certainly Pharaoh had, had no uh, desire to, to accept him either. So Moses went back to where he met with the Lord, and you read a little later in chapter 6 when he encounters the Lord again, Again, the Lord um, says, says to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now to them, they knew me as El Shaddai, as God Almighty. But now you and the children of Israel are to know me as Yahweh. I am who I am. Why would this be significant? Well, see, God is moving now into a new element, a new stage in the progression of the gospel story. And now God was going to take up residence with the children of Israel. He was going to abide with them personally. You know, he would come and go and visit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but now he was to be a presence among them. So, let me back up. Was, was God just name dropping there? I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, I, I am who I am. There's, is there more to the story? And that's what I would like for us to examine today. If you go back to the book of Genesis and, and consider the whole storyline of Scripture, not, not just Old Testament, but also New Testament, uh, it really begins there in the garden. Uh, you go to, to where God had created man and woman in, in chapter 2. Uh, he made them sinless. They, they were in harmony with the law of God. It was imprinted on their hearts and minds. And God gave them time to get to know him. There was a test. 
would they trust him no matter what comes along? So the, the, the test there was this tree in the garden, and we know uh, now in chapter 3 how the devil used the serpent to, to beguile the woman and, and tell the lies. Um, God had warned them, you, you don't want to eat the fruit of that tree. You can eat everything else, but not that one. If you eat that fruit, you will surely die. And the way Moses wrote that in the Hebrew, he says, dying, you will die. Dying is a, is a process. It's an ebbing away of life force that, that takes time to, to run its course, and eventually death is, is the, uh, the result of that. And so the day that they ate that fruit, actually Adam and Eve invoked then this, this law that Paul calls the law of sin and death. Dying, you will die. But God stepped in, did he not? He intervened. He said, I will put enmity between the human family and with, with the devil, with Satan. He would restore harmony with God's law in humanity. And how would he do that? He would do that by becoming the seed of the woman. And not only that, he would crush the head of the serpent. That is the, uh, the, the essence of what we call the everlasting covenant, God covenanting with fallen humanity to restore us to who and what he designed for us to be. So let's... Uh, Let's go on. What we read then is the storyline of God promising to bring a deliverer through humanity and Satan working to oppose that every step of the way. And now the world and the human family, are, they're under new management. Satan has dominion, doesn't he? And you can see what happened uh, to, to the race as time went on. Things uh, got worse and worse. People became more and more evil. It reached the point where if God didn't do something, the whole, the whole plan, the whole race would be lost, down to one righteous person, and that was Noah. So he spared Mo, uh, Noah. He put the antediluvian race to sleep by means of a flood and, and then started over with Noah and, and his offspring. Um, so after the flood, go a few generations, and then Abram winds up on the scene. And so we go to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And for those of you who like to take notes, I put scripture references up at the top so that uh, you can follow along. I, I got to confess, there's a couple of passages that are kind of long and, and I've had to condense them, Reader's Digest style. So uh, if, if you're interested in following the story, you want to catch everything that the Bible has to say. Okay, um, Genesis 12, verses 1 and 2. God calls Abram. He says, get out of your country to a land that I'm going to show you, and I will make of you a great nation. Well, where was Abram? He was in 
Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, we would probably call that Babylon. He might have been, who knows, he might have been actually living in Babylon, but that's, that's irrelevant. The thing is, God says, leave, leave home. He doesn't tell him where he's going. He says, I'm, I'm going to take you to, to a place. And there had to have been enough of a relationship between Abram and God for, for him to obey that, that, that call, wouldn't there? What, in essence, was Abram's response? Okay, in a word. He's 75 years old at that point in his life. And uh, the thing is that Abram knew who was talking to him and knew that he could trust him. So this is what Paul had to say in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. That's Take that middle adverbial phrase clause, whatever that is. I don't know the finer points of grammar. But what, what he said there basically is, by faith, Abraham obeyed. And he went out, not knowing where he went. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. You, we need to keep moving, but you want to chew on that one a little bit. He's looking for a city whose foundation with, has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So, faith has an element of trust that what God says he will do, he'll make good on it. Amen? Do you and I know the Lord that well that if he calls us to do something, we'll, we'll go do it? Point is that faith is a walk. It's not a work. You've heard the pastor say that many times. It's a walk, not a work. So let's move on to chapter 15 in Genesis. Abraham's an older man now. I forget exactly how old. He's got to be at least 87. Um, and El Shaddai, God Almighty, visits him again. And he says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And, and think about this for a moment. Here's, here's Abram in his tent with Sarai. How many children do they have? Like about that many. And God says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Well, how old were they? You know, they were, in our day and age, they were ancient, right? Um, Sarah's womb had been barren the whole time, probably past the time of life where she could bear a child. And, and Abram's thinking, well, I guess my servant's going to be be the inheritance. And, and God says, no. He says, he that shall come forth out of your own body shall be your heir. And then he told Abram, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. So shall your seed be. It's a pretty, pretty outlandish statement, isn't it? 
pretty wild promise, but the thing is, the, the Bible says that Abram believed in the Lord, and the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. So before we go on, I pause just briefly. I want to share this with you. Later on in, in Genesis chapter 15, the Lord goes through a covenant ritual with Abram, right? You re remember there were three animals that it, Abram was, was told to, to split in half, and, and that, was, that was God reaching man where he is. That was the, the ritual of the day when two parties would enter into covenant. Well, so Abram did what he was told, and, and he goes to sleep, and, and then the Lord, Lord passes through, and those animals were, were consumed, uh, signifying that the covenant was, was um, valid, that was put in force. You won't understand that unless you read very carefully about the middle part of, of Galatians chapter 3. And what you will find is that when God entered into covenant with Abram, it was God the Son. It was the one we know, Christ. It was Messiah that took the side of Abraham in the covenant. It was um, what's called in Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 13, the council of peace that father and son entered into agreement with. So this covenant meant nothing unless God the Father was one party and God the Son along with Abram was the other party. We, you can see that in Galatians when Paul said there was no mediator in this covenant because God is one. This was God covenanting with God to be the deliverer of you and me. Okay, enough of that. Um, this is what Paul had to say about Abram. Uh, in Romans chapter 4, verses 3 to 5. So what, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So in that covenant agreement with God and Abram, he was justified. What does that mean? Just as if I'd never sinned. Was Abram righteous in fact? In reality, well, his character was tested just like Adam and Eve character were tested. Remember the story that he had to go into Egypt because of a famine and, um, and so Abram told, told the Egyptians, well, this is my sister here. And, and they went and told Pharaoh, hey, she's, she's pretty hot. You, you ought to meet her. And so he did. And bad things happened to the Egyptians. And, and Pharaoh figured that out. He called Abram and he said, what are you doing to me? What are you doing to my people? And Abram said, well, I was afraid if I told you she's my wife that you'd kill me and then you'd take her for yourself. 
And Pharaoh said, ah, just here, accept these gifts from me, but go away. <laughs> um, same thing happened a little later with the uh, king of the Philistines is called uh, Abimelech. Exact same scenario. He says, uh, she's my sister. Well, we know that's, that's a partial truth. She was a half-sister, but the other half was that, you know, she's my wife. Does a partial truth cut it with God? I don't think so either. Um, point being, bad things happen when we think God needs our help. And the, the um, biggest example of that, I don't have in my notes here, but you remember, they're going to be a great nation, and they don't have any children. So Sarah's going to fix this. Yeah. Take, take my servant, marry her, and, and, and have children with her, and then you'll become a great nation. That didn't work out too good either, did it? Bad things do happen when we think that God needs our help. Bad things have happened to me in my religious experience when I've stepped away from trusting God and, and doing what I thought was best. Maybe you've had that kind of experience too. So, um, Abram was declared righteous. In reality, he wasn't quite there yet. He wasn't yet holy, if you want to look at it that way. And Paul addresses that, too, in the same chapter in Romans 4, in verse 17. He says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. For him whom he believed, even God, who makes alive the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. You hear what Paul is telling us here? When God makes a promise to you and me, God who exists outside of time sees it as a done deal. He sees it as, as reality, but here we are in our time and space. It's not, not yet there. And that's the point. God is calling into existence in you and in me a holiness, a fitness for heaven, which we don't yet possess, which doesn't yet exist. But that's the work that God's about in our lives. Okay. Um, I like how Paul describes this experience with, with Abraham and Sarah. Um, chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. But, but because she judged him faithful who had promised, and therefore sprang there even of one, him as good as dead. How would you like God to describe you as good as dead? <laughs> um, but that was Abraham at that stage of his life. I, even from one as good as dead, so many as the stars in the sky of multitude and the sand which is by the seashore, innumerable. Okay, I, uh, I'm looking at the clock. I see where this is going way too quickly. So um, Isaac's born in chapter 21 of Genesis, and Abram was 100 years old at that time, and Sarah was 90. Something 
not humanly possible took place. But with God, all things are possible. So let's move on to Isaac quickly here. Um, he dwelt in the land where, where his father dwelt, and there was some contention between the people of that land and with, with Isaac and his entourage. Um, and so he had to repeat the same deception that he told, that Abram told um, Abimelech. And, and so he went through all of that. And the, the point being to illustrate here what God said twice in, in the book of Exodus to Moses and, and then right in the Ten Commandments. He said the iniquities of the father are passed on to the children, and children's children, to the third and fourth generation. So Isaac had inherited that, that propensity to, to go into self-protection mode, and that wasn't, that wasn't a good thing. Um, But just the same later, and here in chapter 26, the Lord appeared to Isaac. Same night, he said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, for I am with you, and I will bless you and multiply your seed for my servant Abraham's sake. So the covenant that was made originally with Abram and with Christ don't forget that, was renewed with, with Isaac. Why Isaac? Why not Ishmael? Well, you read farther in, in the book of Galatians and you see that, that uh, Ishmael was the child of human effort, but Isaac was the child of God's promise. Um, And Paul in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 28, you know, he explains this in, down at the end of the chapter. He says, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. All of us here today, we are the children of promise. If you, if you have the faith of, in God that Abraham had, then... By virtue of faith, you are Abraham's children. What's ironic here in, in this covenant is that God has told Isaac that um, the child of promise would come through him. That child of promise was the one we know as, as Jesus. So, in a sense, Isaac is the ancestor of Jesus' coming. Isn't that right? But in another sense, Isaac is the descendant of Jesus, the ancestor of promise that was given to us. Um, all right. Isaac marries Rebecca at age 40. They're married for 20 years, have no children. And then Jacob and Esau are born. Isaac's 60 years old at the time. Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out, they called his name Esau. And after that came, came his brother out, and his name was called Jacob. And as I mentioned, Isaac was three score years old. We call that 60. I'm three score and 10 now. Okay. Um, Now you have the family dynamic of 
Isaac, Rebekah, Esau, and, and Jacob. Isaac gravitated more toward Esau. He, he favored Esau. Esau liked to hunt for wild game, and, and Isaac loved to hear those, the stories of those exploits, and he loved to eat the wild game that, that Isaac would bring back. Um, Jacob, he was mama's boy. I don't mean that in a bad way, but he, you know, he was he was the shepherd. He would uh, tended the the family business that way, but he also had the characteristics that Rebecca knew that he should be the next in line to receive this birthright that God was giving. This is one of those lengthy passages I talked about, 13 verses in Genesis 27. It's the story of Jacob at Rebekah's urging to perpetuate this, this business of deception that goes on from generation to generation. And... Uh, you know, Isaac's pretty old now. He feels like he's about to die. And, uh, and actually, Jacob was 77 at this stage of life, and, which means that Isaac was 137. He didn't know how much longer he had. So he wanted to pass on the birthright, and he wanted to give it to Esau. Now that's a problem, because Esau really had no interest in it. He had allegedly, you know, sold it to Jacob for for a bowl of lentils. Those must have been some really, really good lentils. But he, but Esau didn't care. That that's that wasn't him. That's not what he was about. But Jacob did care, and Rebecca did care. And there was a crisis because, because Isaac's about to give the birthright to Esau. Something's got to give here. And, and what did I say about bad things happening? It's when we think that God needs our help, it, it, it doesn't turn out good. Um, so Isaac tells Esau, go, go bring me some venison and make, make it uh, the way I like uh, before I die and I'll give you the blessing. The thing is, Rebecca heard that and and then she went to Jacob, and this is, this is her strategy. This is her way of helping out God. She says, obey my voice according to what I command you. She said, go, go kill a sheep, go whatever, I think it was a goat, a young goat, and bring it to me, and I'll fix it the way that Isaac likes it, and we'll We'll bring it to Isaac before Esau gets home. And that way, you get the birthright. Well, you see, you see Jacob's response to this here. He says, my father perhaps will feel me and I shall seem to him as a deceiver. Jacob <laughs> saw the enormity of the, of the risk involved here. And he said, and I shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing. Rebecca said, don't, don't worry about that. Just do what I told you. And let the curse fall on me. So we know, we know the story. They pulled off the deception. 
Jacob has received the birthright. Shortly later, Esau comes home. He says, give me my blessing. And Isaac has to tell you, well, I'm sorry, I already gave it. And the whole deception just blows up. And Isaac's furious that his, his brother stole this from him. So he's, he's going to be out to get him. And Rebecca knows that. And Jacob knows it. And so Rebecca says, you, you better go away for a little while. Go up north to my brother. And, and when things cool down, I'll, I'll send for you. In chapter 28 of Genesis, we read, I am the Lord your God of Abraham and your father and the God of Isaac. The land whereon you lie, this is Jacob on his way north to Laban. He lays down for the night. Remember the story? Lay down on, uh, on a stone for a pillow and in, in a dream and a vision, the Lord lowers a ladder from heaven and Jacob sees angels going up and down and um, this is what the Lord said to, to Jacob I'm the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac the land whereon you lie to you will I give it and to your seed and your seed shall be as the dust of the earth and in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed so now the covenant promise has moved on from Abraham th through Isaac on to Jacob now. And, and Jacob's in exile, running for his life. And God's going to make a, a, a nation out of him and fulfill the promise through him. We, we know that Jacob dwelt with his uncle Laban for 20 years. And that wasn't all um, peaches and cream either, was it? Uh, he loved Rachel, the younger of, of two sisters, and, and wanted to marry her. Laban um, said, okay, just work for me seven years and you, you can have her. So he did that. Those, those years went by in a flash for him because of how much he loved Rachel. And the wedding night comes. It's dark. He's in his tent. And who comes in? But Leah, the older sister. And... Uh, Jacob wakes up, sees what happened, and he says, uh, why did you deceive me? You know, in, in other religions, they have this word called karma. I don't know if that's something that God really subscribes to, but it seems like what, what goes around comes around, doesn't it? You know, and if you think about it, it's our human nature at times to learn things the hard way. When God allows a test to cross our path and we don't respond in faith and, and in trust, well, that test will come back another time and it might be a little more difficult. And and then if we don't pass that test, it will bring another one. He keeps bringing them until we get it, that, that we need to trust the Lord. That was why uh, Abra Abraham had to offer up Isaac there on Mount Moriah. But I'm, I'm uh, digressing here. 
Jacob then in, in 20 years time, he winds up with four wives and count them 12 sons and one daughter and a whole mess of sheep and goats and servants. And um, yeah, I was way ahead of my notes. In Genesis 31, the Lord tells him, I'm, I'm the God of Bethel. We met there where you anointed that pillar and where you vowed a vow to me, you promised me you would serve me. So now get up and, and go out from this land and go back to your family that we have to fast forward through uh, that experience with with him and his uncle Laban but they got things smoothed out he's on his way back Genesis chapter 32 verse 3 Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau his brother he's on his way back he has, again, a big family, huge entourage, a lot of possessions, livestock, and, and everything. And so he, he said, sent messengers ahead to his brother. Let him know, we're, we're on the way. We're, we're coming back to you. Was Jacob a little apprehensive about that? Well, he was when he got the report back from the messengers. He said, the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and also he's coming to meet you and with 400 men. Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed and he divided the people that was with him. He he sent um, Rachel and Zilpah, their children and, and half, half of the family business one way. And he sent Leah and Bilhah and their children and the other half of the family business another way. And with the thought in mind, well, I'm going to lose one of them, but at least one of them will, will still be left. So they're gone. Jacob's going to lay down for the night. Genesis chapter 32, verses 9 to 12. He's praying to God because he, he's, in, he's really in great distress right now. He said, O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, catch the what he says here, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have showed your servant. And then he pleads with God, deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother. You said I will surely do you good and make your seed as the sand of the sea. What, what did he just do there? What did he just say? That, you know, Lord, in case you've forgotten, this is what you told me you were going to do. So I know enough about you to know that you'll do it. But at the same time, I'm not worthy of any of this. So we had this internal conflict, that dynamic between unworthiness and God's promise. What happened? Later in the same chapter, Genesis 32, Jacob's left alone. And there he wrestled with a, with a man until the breaking of the day. He thought he might have been wrestling with his own brother. And then when he saw that he prevailed not against him, 
when Jacob saw he prevailed not against the man he was wrestling with, the man touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. The man, spoken of in there, dislocated Jacob's hip. He's in excruciating pain now. Probably can't hardly stand up. He wrestled with him, and, and the man, by now Jacob knows who he's wrestling with. It's El Shaddai, it's God Almighty manifesting himself there to wrestle with Jacob. And, he, and El Shaddai says, let me go for daybreak is, is coming. And Jacob, bless his heart, he, he just cries out, I will not let you go except you bless me. There's times when we have to hold on to the Lord when everything else is going sideways in our life. Isn't that true? My mother used to have a plaque hanging up in, in her apartment. It said, when you reach the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. It's uh, been good advice for me over the years. So now El Shaddai asks him, well, what's your name? He knew his name. He said, Jacob. What does Jacob mean? It means deceiver, supplanter. And he said, your name shall be called Jacob no more, but Israel, for as a prince, you have power with God and with men and have prevailed. As a, a prince, what does that mean? He's the son of the king. Who's the king? Who's the king of kings and lord of lords? Jacob prevailed with him. Did, was Jacob wrestling with God to you know, save me from my brother? No. Was God wrestling with Jacob to say, I know your unworthiness. I don't care. You're still my prince. And I will, I'll take care of your unworthiness. And that's, that's the battle for you and me. We know what we've done in our lives, don't we? And if we don't, there are spirits out there that will remind us. And if that's not enough, we have family and friends that will remind us of our unworthiness. But God says, wrestle with me. Trust that I will restore you to who you're supposed to be. I have the power to perform that. Okay, I'm talking too long here. One statement from a book called Patriarchs and Prophets, page 201. Jacob's experience during that night of wrestling and anguish represents the trial through which the people of God must pass before Christ's second coming. You and I, we, we all have to deal with the record of our own lives. We know our history and most everyone else does. But we need to know that we've made a full, complete repentance, like Jacob did, to place not 95%, not 98%, not 99.8%, but 100% trust in God, that what he has promised each of you and to me personally, he 
will perform it. We just have to be willing to accept that promise and to accept the process. So we have to go through this too before the Lord will come. Uh, Jeremiah talked about that in chapter 30 and verse 7. Alas, for that day is great. What day is that? Uh, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But do you see the promise I underlined? But he shall be saved out of it. You and I will be saved out of it. If, if that's one witness isn't enough for you, well then we have Psalm 20 in verse 1. The Lord hear you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend you. El Shaddai, God Almighty, but he's also Yahweh, the one who abides in us. So we will each pass through our own time of trouble. If we go to sleep before the Lord comes, we'll have that moment of trusting that the Lord will wake us, wake me up again. Or if we live to see Jesus come, and like the children of Israel, with the Red Sea before them and Pharaoh's army behind them and a walled canyon where there's no escape and we're between the devil and the deep blue sea, that's when our trust will have its sternest test, but it'll be the moment of triumph for us. Um, So, where do we go from here? What, what do we have to do? What does God require of us? 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and uh, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away. Do we not see that? Look around what's taking place. The world's wearing out. Humanity's wearing out. The world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that does what? The will of God abides forever. does the will of God, trusts that when God says, I'd like for you to do this, that he opens up the way for us and gives us what we need to be able to perform it. So those are our marching orders, you might say. So we need to be a child of Abraham a child of trust, as Paul wrote in First Corinthians or Second Corinthians, chapter six, he said, "Come out from among them and be separate," says the Lord, "and touch not the unclean thing. I will receive you and will be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters," says the Lord Almighty. Be a child of Abraham, a child of trust. Be a child of Isaac. John 14, verse 23. This, these words of Jesus are beyond astounding. There in the upper room, Jesus answered and said to, to him, I forget which disciple, uh, might have been Philip, but he said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. What does that mean? I'll obey my commandments. 
and my father will love him. And what does he say next? We, who's, who's we? will come unto him and make our abode with him. This is not El Shaddai. This is Yahweh taking up residence in our lives. And that's on top of what he just said a couple of verses earlier, that when the Comforter would come, that he would be not only with us, but he would be in us. He's saying the whole Godhead family is willing to take up residence in our hearts and minds and do the work that needs to be done so we can go home. So be a child of, of Isaac. Be a child of promise. And lastly, be a child of Jacob. 1 John verse 5, 4. And whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Jacob said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. Have you had that kind of a, a trial in your life where you had to wrestle with God over something and you're not willing to let go of him and walk away until he bless you? That's a time of trouble, again, that we will all have to, to pass through. And so, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Please choose life that both you and your children may live, that you may not, that you may love the Lord your God, and that you may obey his voice, and that you may cleave Join unto him, for he is your life and the length of your days, that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give him. That land is, is no piece of real estate on this earth. That land is our heavenly home. And he's promised, he's promised it to us. So, let's pray. Holy Father, I can't speak for others here in this sanctuary, but I can speak for myself. And I know I'm not worthy of the least of the good things that you've given to me and done for me. You, you are love and goodness and kindness and mercy and, and truth. And you do what you do because you are I am. I am who I am. This world's going away quickly but your words will live forever. May they live in our hearts and minds forever that may, we may live with you when you come take us home. In Jesus' name, amen.